The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Mary, could you stand up, please? Yeah. Just from the moment uh, that I come in, I just hear the Lord saying that that this is a a whole new, you're past the worst part, and the detour signs are are no longer there, and it's like there's a clear highway taking you forward in the plans and the purposes. You're on the other side, and God says, do not be distracted by the signs to the left and to the right. You just stay looking straight ahead, because God's got uh, an acceleration coming for you, and a whole new chapter in your life. Uh, You're you're on the other side, and that's the best part. But God says, uh, fear not. Uh, I'm about to bring into your life uh, a support system that uh, you weren't prepared for, but know that it's of me, says the Lord. So we just thank you for that. And Mary, uh, the Lord wants you to know that he very much has his hand on your children. And the Lord says to you, fear not, because... If they go, when they go in a wrong direction or start to go in a wrong direction, God says he's going to put his hand there and he's going to block their way. So know that God cares more than you do and he is seeing that they get to their God-appointed places in life and in the kingdom of God. So fear not, fear not. And Brianne, stand up. This is the day and the season of your health and your healing is coming now in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just release that anointing right now to bring physical health to your body. God's changing even your DNA and your entire system because you're in a new bloodline. You're in the bloodline of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, Hereditary things and things are going away. God is reshaping, remolding, and bringing health to that physical body that you sought, you've sought, and you've sought, but God says, know this, that this is the time of transition. There's been a great season of gestation, but now God says, I am bringing to birth those things that have been promised in times past. In Jesus and I'm name. seeing, Brianne, that there's some things that you've put on the back burner, so to speak, and have just left there. And God says that he's going to prompt you. And some of those things that you have relegated to forget about that right now, God says he's going to bring those forth. And God says there will be an anointing on it, and you will know, and the timing will be just right, says the Spirit of God. And this is interesting. This is something I'm sensing. I want to tune the coals to stand up. Nicole and Nicole. Because clearly, God says, you are on the other side. You're in the place of blessing. You're in the place of an open heaven. And unprecedented favor is coming upon both Nicoles. Amen. And Jennifer can see you now. She's got 20-20 vision. So if you're making, if you look like you're sleeping in the back row, she's going to come and go. <clears throat> hmm. Actually, that's kind of, some of that's in the sermon. How many feel like something broke free this week? Something broke free this week. There was, uh, there was like pressure, but there was also uh, a season to where almost everyone I came in contact that are not even related to each other all sensed the breakthrough. This is a, clearly a new chapter. God is doing something. It is definitely a new season in a general way. The sp- specifics you need to seek the Lord on for the specifics and how that applies to you. But in general, there is a, this is a time and a season of favor. So open up and uh, God's going to rekindle some of the things that have been lying dormant in your life, including gifts of the Spirit. God is basically releasing that right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I just wanted to say one more thing. To you, Sean, and to Jason and Gwen, there is life on the other side of parenthood. (laughs) Wait, that's pretty profound here. Wait a minute, let me think about that for a while. 
So I'm saying that the Lord, the Lord is going to come and bring some order out of the chaos, and he's going to bring some peace when there's been turmoil, and he's going to bring a time of rest when there's been a time of sleeplessness. So know that God is in control of the situation, and the Lord says, you learn to rest in him, and he's going to be, bring rest into your households. Amen. And I, uh, a word for the church at, here locally, but also those that watch on Ustream that are connected with us. I am totally convinced that the Lord's been speaking uh, uh, a strong, a strong directive that those of you that are employees, you need to humble yourself and start working as if God were your boss, not your boss. There's, there's attitudes now where God says, uh, promotion doesn't come from the east or the west, but it's God that lifts up one and puts down another, and your attitude can determine it. If, if you don't like the job you've got, you're on this stinky old job, then you be the best person on that stinky old job, and God will get you out of there and promote you. But if you maintain an attitude of, I'm on this stinky job and I hate it and I don't like it, you can be there a little longer. You can't hurry them up, but you can certainly slow it down, can't you? So employees, I really want to speak to as an employees. You need to see that as your mission field. That You need to see that as the place where God has placed you in that arena. And that life is 90% attitude, 10% circumstances. As a believer, start getting the victory over those circumstances, especially those negative ones. Because there's, there's people in the world that are not even saved. They don't even have Jesus. And they've learned to be resilient. They've learned to make life the best they can. They rise up in the midst of difficult situations. And they use it as a schoolmaster to teach you and train you and build your character. And remember, those of you that need to see all of your jobs as ministry. That's your ministry. Wherever you're placed, that's your ministry. And God basically, in the life of Jesus, was a ratio of 10 to 1, building the character over the ministry. So if you don't like where you're at, say, God, what do you, what's it reveal in me? What, what's it showing that needs to change in me? Because uh, really, 30 years of character building for Jesus for three years of ministry. That is a ratio of 10 to 1. So God really does care about your attitude and your character. Attitude will determine your performance in the days ahead. And if you're a business owner, you don't own it. You're a steward. Big difference. Parents, you don't own your children. You're a steward. Big difference. Who owns the vineyard anyway? What's his name? Jesus, right? He owns the vineyard, not you. But you're a steward and you'll be held accountable for what you did with what you've gotten. And Marcus, don't point to heaven. You'll point, point right here. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus in here. Okay. All right. Thank you. So... Let's just pray that God finds out of this message this morning a specific word for you that literally penetrates, that you carry with you, that it becomes a word that it's uh, Jesus himself being written on the tablet of your heart. You don't need more information in your head. What you need is a transformed life. And you need a word that changes you, just as worship. You should enter into the presence of God. You should never be the same. It should be impossible to worship from the heart and not be changed at some level. So, uh, basically I want to talk about vision this morning. Um, and hopefully, hopefully I'm going to get some of you out of your comfort zone. Uh, I said that once and someone said, I don't have a comfort zone, just various levels of anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> so, then we're going to start there then, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> Get you out of your comfort zone. I don't have a comfort zone. I haven't had a comfort zone in years. Just various levels of anxiety. So I'm going, well, be anxious for nothing but by prayer. So somehow we're going to have to get you to make the switch from anxiety to the peace of God, the rule of God, the Lordship of Jesus. All right. So now uh, I want to start out with the fact that I believe that God is speaking vision. And, and I, I really believe that we need to understand both the internal vision and the external vision to really apply that topic properly. You understand from the very beginning, this is a little, little basic theology, that um, the human race was hijacked in the garden, correct? Uh, Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and really received the wrong spirit. 
And we inherited that sin nature. That sin infected the whole world. Um, but by nature, the scripture says we were children of wrath. That means it's our, our nature. That means all those nice people. See, my dad had a hard time getting saved because he was so nice. Do you believe that? There's people that are just it's like, what do I need that for? You, you need it, Dennis. But that, that was my dad's attitude. Dennis, he needs salvation. <laughs> but he was a basically good guy, and he really was, and he didn't have any enemies. But basically, once he saw the change in me, he said, I have to admit that if you're honest with what's in your own heart, we clearly all need Jesus. There's no one righteous, no, not one. And that's a self-discovery that anybody can make. And for him, it was a redemptive one. So we need a twofold redemption. Uh, we need the blood for the forgiveness of sin. It's a very basic 101 Christianity, right? And secondly, the cross, where we enter into the Messiah's death so that we can have a new spirit. I've been crucified with the Messiah. It is no longer I who live, but Messiah lives in me. Is that true? Then we want to go back to God's original intent. I want to speak a vision, but we can't speak a vision without getting the macro before you get the micro. Before you see some specificity for your own life, you need to see the overall plan of God. And in God's original intent is found in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And you could go back and refer to this all the time, even to just kind of get your life squared away. And ask yourself, you know, where, where, if I've gone off to the left or to the right, you know, where does this fit? And here's something that we discovered. This is a combination of my revelation and Jennifer's revelation, and they matched. And this got us excited. We teach this in some of our modules. But when we were traveling, I saw that there was a, a need that God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So he created him in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and gave and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and have dominion. The word predestined at the same time that I was teaching this, that I saw... I saw, first of all, God predetermined that He was going to create you for a relationship, number one. He's a relational God. And that it was a trust relationship. Okay? In the image He created you, He created you, then He blessed them. Now, how did God bless us? Well, He gave us His own love nature. And so I saw that he wanted intimacy and a relationship where we trusted him, number one. But number two, he wanted character development. He wanted us to be a partakers of that love. We love because he first loved us. And character change was required as a second step. Just going to what's the basic requirement? I want a trust relationship and I want to put my love nature in you. Thirdly, value. And I've watched so many people struggle with this. Value. Intrinsic value. Intrinsic value means before you did anything. You know how we used to pray for people to kind of even get a breakthrough? We used to say, I want you to just yield to God and say, God, show me how beautiful I was before, in, in your eye, not my eye, in your eye before I was formed in my mother's womb. Do you know what that removes? That removes all of your beating yourself up for your failures. How beautiful was I in your mind's eye before I was formed? What did I look like before I was born in my mother's womb? You can't blame yourself for anything you did there, right? You can't say, well, oh, you know, you don't understand. And so that value being intrinsic said that if we were to then have this love, trust relationship, love nature, and if we functioned out of that value, that would be true functioning. Some people function to get value. That's earning it. 
No, no, no. Function out of the fact that I am already valued. And then you, you want reciprocity then. You want to love God. You want to satisfy His heart. And then fourthly, it, I saw that to have dominion and to reproduce. Now you reproduce according to kind. So here's my four words. In that portion of Scripture, as far as God's original intent, I saw relationship, character, function, and reproduction. Relationship, God, start there. God wants an intimate relationship. And He wants His nature in, in, imparted into us. So He wanted character development. And thirdly, He wanted you to function, but function out of who you really are in Him. And then reproduce, because you can only reproduce according to kind. All right? I'm teaching those four principles, and they're so meaningful to me. Jennifer's in prayer, and the Lord just dropped a word into her spirit of predestined. And she says, I heard just as clear as could be, God hit me with that word predestined. And so she looked it up, and there were only four predestines in the New Testament. And she basically said, you know, in psychology and school, uh, in humanistic thought, they teach, uh, what was it, Maslow? Taught a hierarchy of need for self-actualization, though. It has nothing to do with God. It's totally humanistic. And Jennifer says, God, what is your hierarchy of need. And I'm saying, well, Jennifer, if we look at Genesis, I see God's hierarchy of need right there. And she said she was praying about it, and she got four different words. And it matched those four words exactly the same. She got trust, love, right, value, and purpose. I got basically relationship, Trust, that was the match. Love, character, value, function. Because God wants you to function. But He wants you to function out of that value. And lastly, reproduce, or she got purpose. And you know, where purpose is not known, this is worth writing down, where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. You will distort it somehow. It's just like when people don't have the right answers. They have a tendency to fill in the gap with a guess. <laughs> but well, something as important as a predestined life that God gave to you, I don't want to guess. Do you? That's why I want to talk about vision this morning, because I don't want it to be guesswork. But I want to go make sure that I'm following the parameters that were established in the Scripture. And so, I looked down, and Jennifer looked at predestined. And she gave the Scriptures, and they matched our four words. Whom He predestined, He also called. What did He call you to? A trust relationship. There's my word and her word. Trust and relationship. You are predestined and called to that relationship. The second predestined. Whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. There's the love character. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Having been, here's the third one, having been predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. Now remember, adoption as sons means come into full maturity. You're functioning the way you were intended to function, and you're ready to take over the family business. That's adoption in the biblical term. Adoption is not like you adopt a baby. Adoption means you've grown into the place of responsibility. Now we can pass the mantle to you, and you can run the family business. Adoption means maturity. And what was my word for that? Function. You function properly. What was Jennifer's word for it? Value. You're functioning out of the mature, intrinsic value that God had placed within you. And lastly, predestined. In Him, we've also 
obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose, there it is right there, of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, Ephesians 1.11. If you want these four predestined words, let me give you the four scriptures. You might want to write this down and look at these things because this will keep you on a railroad track of a steady, steady, purposeful life, especially in a time and a season when you're in transition, when there's distractions to the left and to the right. And I believe that we're coming out of that. But I still think we need to be aware of it because whenever you're into something new, there's going to be multiple voices. There's going to be the voice of the city. There's going to be the, the voice that comes from the temple, but there's the voice of the Lord that you've got to really focus in on. There's a lot of voices, the voice of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, predestined for trust or relationship is Romans 8.30. I said, this must be really important, Jennifer, because what he's giving me in my four words, he gave you as a hierarchy of need in your four words, and then just dropped in your spirit that this was, we were predestined, and the only four predestined words in the, in the New Testament match. He's trying to speak something very clearly to us, and I'm saying, this is the way to keep yourself focused on the purpose and the plans of God. Because I see people shipwreck all the time like, oh, my dreams are shattered and I had this plan and this. And, and, and I can't tell in some cases whether it was a pizza dream or it was a redemptive revelation. And there's a big difference because you can really go off on something you want that God never intended you to have. It's just your flesh. So how are you going to know the difference? Here's the railroad tracks, the scriptural railroad tracks to keep you focused and to find out if you've gone astray how to get back. You were predestined for trust, Romans 8.30. You were predestined for love or character change. And that's found in Romans 8.29. You were predestined for value, Ephesians 1, five. And predestined for purpose, Ephesians 1.11. Those are the four predestined words in the New Testament. So we are really without excuse because there is a, there is a plan, at least the macro, the big picture, is laid out for us. Stay with the big picture and now we can go to the micro. Okay? So why vision? Well, you know, uh, if we look at the story of Joshua... There was a whole new generation, and this must be timely with what's going on right now, I feel, in the spirit. You know, it says, after the death of Moses, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to take a land which I'm going to give you and the children of Israel. God gave me a vision that kept me going for 42 years. And whenever I want to check myself out, I always go back to the original intent and see how am I doing with the original intent. And when I looked at this, I saw there's dimensional revelation and directional revelation. If I could help young people and mentor them into the plans and the purposes and, the, and to see their dreams come true in their life, I, I have to emphasize the part they want to skip, and that's the internal work. They want to quick do what God told them to do. We are prone to doing before we're allowing God to do His work. What about, what about uh, Moses? Didn't he, wouldn't that be problematic? God had to mentor him for 40 years in the wilderness. The vision was his people. So he killed an Egyptian who, was, who had killed an Israel. His passion was to deliver them. In his youth, he did it the wrong way. Then 40 years tending sheep, somehow, you say, why does it take so long? Because the tendency is to do what you think God's telling you to do over the character change that is required to function in it. Isn't this the part where you go like this? Ah, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear that because I'm in a hurry. I'm, I, I can remember me. I... I Joined the army at 19 for six years, and I went into deep depression. Don't tell me you don't think like this, because I, 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 a lot of young people think like this. 19 years old, but I went into a deep depression because I was in the army for six years. I'll be 25 years old. 
Oh, by the time I get out, I just stayed in bed for a whole day because I'm going to be an old 25-year-old. By the time I get out, nobody else thinks like that, right? But that, therein lies the danger. Because during that depression, then God could basically try to do one thing in my life, and the world, the flesh, and the devil would try to do something else to get me to hurry up the process, right? So, dimensional revelation. God gave me Scripture as a railroad track. How many have particular favorite Scriptures that are written in your Bible? That's not a coincidence. That's a railroad track that when you get off track, you go back to that scripture and you'll find out you start to get your head screwed on again. What was yours, Jennifer? Gen uh, Jeremiah 29. I know the plans that I have for you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Right, Jer still Jeremiah 29. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and that's not a casual walk in the park. That's a passionate pursuit. Mine was Philippians 3.10, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood. Every time there was another aspect of his character, his nature, every other name that he was named in the Bible depicting some aspect of his nature, I embraced that and wanted to know it experientially. I didn't want to know it in my head. I wanted to embrace that, that I might know him. You see, that's the dimensional revelation. If you skip the dimensional revelation, you can have all of these plans. I'm going to be a preacher. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be a, a business owner, and I'm going to have this, and I'm going to have a, a whole uh, you know, a network of this and network of that. You can get so focused on that that it doesn't happen because success and destiny function together. If you get off the track of the internal work you get into success. And there's a lot of unhappy, successful people. There's a lot of unsaved, successful people. But if you fulfill destiny, success is automatically in there. You cannot fulfill your destiny without great personal satisfaction and fulfillment. So if you're in this place of blah, 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 it's probably something in you that needs to change in the way of attitude because God has you exactly where you are. Every temptation even that comes your way that you get irritated with is specifically designed to let you see what's in your heart so that you can remedy it, get it out of your heart so that you can move on. Remember, you be the best old person you can be on that stinky job and God will promote you. When I got off of drugs, I was so bad on, on drugs that I just quit working and went on welfare. Then I get saved, and I went to welfare school. I had a college education, but I'm going to welfare school. And they're teaching me, this little box, you check male. This little box, female. <laughs> that was good for me, though. You know what? That was like getting hit along the side of the head. They're saying, you brought yourself here. They didn't do this to you. You did this to you. And the minute I decided that I was going to make something, I said, I'm going to do anything. Listen to this, young people, because uh, I'm afraid this is a weak area uh, in, a, in, a, in an entire generation. Because of the world's influence of entitlement, God had me take a job that was half of what I was getting on welfare half and it was cleaning toilets and mopping uh, where the truckers came in to talk to the dispatcher mop floors clean toilets and I had uh, five restrooms to clean and I would go in and do that as unto the Lord and the presence of God would get so strong I would get drunk it could have been the Clorox but <laughs> but I would literally get drunk in the spirit Cleaning toilets. I'm telling you, there's something about an attitude. Because it was only a week or two, and the guy came up to me. First of all, I already baffled him. Because God sent me for that job 
three times. They told me no twice. And when I came back the third time, because God's telling me to, I was actually relieved the first two times <laughs> that they said no. I have to be honest. I have to be honest. But then I went back and I said, I'll do anything. And the third time, the guy says, I haven't had anybody come for a job three times in a row in 20 years. He said, you know, I'm going to hire you just because of that. So he hired me to do that. I was cleaning the toilets. I'm getting drunk in the spirit, I hope. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he came up and he says, do you know, by any chance, know how to do payroll? And I go, yes. Do you know how to do this? Yeah. He literally made an office job out of everybody's overflow. And I went from cleaning toilets to my own office in the trucking firm and had to work with a guy who was anti-God, who was, money was his God. And I can still remember, this is, this, is, this is dating me, but he had the headband and the one earring, which in that day kind of typified who you were and where you're coming from. And he basically looked at my car and it was all full of rust holes. And he goes, look at this. What's your God doing for you? you you're, you're, this piece of junk won't even pass Pennsylvania inspection. What's your God? Look at this. And he took off an expensive watch and he threw it against the wall, smashed the pieces. I can go buy another one. He says, what's your God doing for you? And so I knew he had this thing. So I had a free Bible that you're supposed to give away free New Testament. I said, you got so much money, you never bought anything from me. What, what? Hit his pride button a little bit. I says, I got this Bible here for $10 <laughs> or $5. It was supposed to be free. I said, unless, unless you're afraid of it. Now, he was the, the uh, head mechanic manager. He had mechanics. He had guys that were hijacking meats. He had guys that were doing drugs. He had guys that had killed somebody. And I, this was his. And unless you're afraid of this Bible, you never bought anything from me. Pulls out his wallet and he goes, here, I'll buy that. Put it in his desk. And all of a sudden, long story short, I scared him half to death. And he sat in a Christian businessman's lunch because I was the guest speaker. And he sit, and he shook like this. <laughs> the guy next to him said, I was in a helicopter crash and, uh, and, uh, and angels picked me up. And so he goes, this guy's over here going, oh, well, I had, I've seen a, a, a demonic experience and this thing happened and God did deliver. And he's going, oh, my. And he's in a whole room full of these people and I'm the speaker giving just as much. And he's going, he gets in the car and he goes, I'd get saved, but I can't face those guys back there. And so anyway, I'm back there and I'm doing the payroll books. Now, I'm, I'm saying this all not to show off. What I'm saying is, is attitude. It was the attitude. Because this was by far not an ideal job for someone with some college education. But I had, looking at these payroll books, and the Lord spoke and said, your time here is done. But I didn't quit. He just told me, your time here is done. I get a phone call when I get home that the factory, there was a machine that nobody could run that I used to run when I was real young. It made really big money. And they called me and they says, uh, we've gone through all the union members and nobody wants that job. It's too hard, but you can make uh, peace work. Uh, you get paid for 12 hours work an eight hour day if you did enough. And I, I always could make money on that job, but it was hard work. And I went back and I got that job and basically God just kept promoting from there the finances. But it was basically the attitude it was the attitude will determine your performance. And if you want to get out of where you're stuck, start with changing the attitude. Be the best person you can be on that stinky old job. But I saw that it's dimensional and directional. In the scripture, Paul had it. Paul said, it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me. That's his primary calling. Out of all the things the Apostle Paul did, the primary calling was that God called me from my mother's womb to reveal his son in me. If you skip that part and just go to the doing, you're going to shipwreck. 
Secondly, the external vision. Dimensional is what's taking place inside, revealing his son in me. Directionally is found in Acts chapter 26, verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I did what God showed me to do. I went where he told me to go. So there is the forward vision directionally, but there is the dimensional vision that if you skip it, you're going to have problems. And we're going to get to that because um, God's got wonderful things planned for all of us, but he really requires us to focus. It's through faith and patience we what? Inherit the promises through faith and patience. We don't like the patience part, but that's, they're like twins. Everywhere in scripture you see faith and patience. Faith and patience, they work together. Now, why is vision even important? Because it gives the direction that's necessary when the heart's right. Your direction can be accurate and your timing can be off. You agree? No, I don't like give so many of these stories, but this, these, are all, these are all lessons for me. I knew from the moment that I got filled with the Spirit that I was to plant churches. To plant a new work was the term. To plant. And I had a little Bible study in the office where I worked, and everybody tapped into that with their opinion. So you, can't, you have to learn how to hear God regards the people. And they said, Dennis, you should start a church. Dennis, you should start a church. Dennis, you should start a church. This is great. Don't just have a Bible study. You should start. Well, I already knew that was part of my calling, right? I used their encouragement as the motivation. You got to be careful with that because it'll tap into something that's legitimate. I got 13 people. We rented a little building in a hotel. We held hands in a circle. And God said, almost in an audible voice, I'm not in this. A little humiliation does you good. I'm not in this. Do you know what it did from that point on? If God didn't direct it, I didn't care what anybody said. I don't care if they confirmed and what's worse, I didn't go looking for the confirmation. I wanted God. So much so that it took four, four internationally known preachers to take me to lunch to tell me it's time to start. So I think I learned from that other lesson. You don't want to do it if it's not God, no matter how good of an idea. A good idea is not necessarily a God idea. Amen. All right? Now... But I'll tell you what, what I'm going to pray for is everybody in this room that he wants to give you direction. It'll give you purpose and passion. It keeps you going in the hard places. That's what vision will do. But it, you make better decisions. Uh, you hit the target, so to speak. How many have friends that have been in Christianity for a long time, but it's been a long term, nothing's ever worked? Isn't that sad? And they're good people. But I have never, ever seen fruit that usually indicates there is an internal work that you're bypassing for a legitimate external thing that you're looking for. In other words, you're trying to fulfill your dream, but you're not really following the instruction of the Lord. You're either doing it too fast or doing it your own way. But without hearing from God and, and allowing Him to build. You know, he wants to build his church. I don't build a church. He's building his church. You speak what he says, and it works. But God basically, this morning, wants to deal with shattered dreams. Let's be honest. How many have had shattered dreams? Stuff you thought God was going to do, and he didn't do it. So, that I mean, that's your perception. Well, the truth of the matter is Satan hates dreamers in the first place. Huh? Because he has, the prince of the power of the air, he has reign and jurisdiction. But a dreamer 
infiltrates that territory and brings it under the lordship of Jesus, that destroys his place. So he would, he would hate a true pioneer, a true dreamer, a true visionary. So if he hates it, he's going to challenge them because they're, they're rivaling uh, his reign over a territory. And the temptation for you as a Christian, and we want to eradicate this this morning, is twofold. Either he uses delay or doubt. If you're a note taker, write that down because this can get you back on track. He either uses delay or doubt to rob you of your dream and the vision that God's placed within your heart. Delay or doubt. Can you imagine what Joseph went through? I had this vision of brothers bowing down to me. <laughs> yeah, where did that get him? The pit, then the prison, and ultimately the palace. Isn't that funny that the pit and the prison precedes the palace? Right? Was the vision accurate? Yeah. But it sure there was definitely delay. I once had a school teacher try to tell me that at the last minute, Joseph got a revelation of forgiveness and forgave his brothers. I go, no, 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 no. That's, I know where that came from. That came from our indoctrination of our school system, the perfectibility of man through education. No, no. Joseph learned forgiveness in the pit. He learned forgiveness in the prison. He, he, he was a man in the making That's right. for such a time as this before he went into the palace. He did not suddenly get in a revelation that he needed to forgive that God did this, not man. The second one is doubt. I can remember how I got attacked with doubt with the vision. God gave me the vision of a dome, eventually built a dome church. But there was a big period of time between the vision and the building of the church. And the dome, by the way, was, to, was primarily an internal process, not an external building. The external building simply modeled the internal truth that we taught in the vision of the dome. But what God was basically saying is that when you plant a church, I want you to create an atmosphere that's love, acceptance, and forgiveness, and grace. I want the foundation to be no other foundation other than intimacy with God. The pillar is going to be worship in the Word, but it's going to be intimacy that goes to transformation. And from transformation to the third pillar of actually, uh, you, would, you would call it uh, evangelization, but in reality it was more uh, producing out of the maturity, the maturity, releasing it. You reproduce according to kind, but the kind was supposed to be mature. <laughs> and out of the base of that temple would flow rivers of living water, just like in Ezekiel. That was the picture that he gave me, but the pattern was practical for an internal development. You start building that here before you're going to build it out there. If it's not real in here, it's never going to take place properly out there. But doubt, I would hear, God, how am I going to do this? And what you're teaching, you're teaching me to tell other people. And some of them look like deer in headlights. And they don't, they don't understand what I'm saying. Maybe I should change it and make it easier. And boy, did I get reprimanded. No. But I'm looking at them and I'm going, most of this audience are people older than me. I'm in my 20s and they're older than me and they know more stuff and they look like they don't know what I'm talking about. He says, then they should go find out why they don't know what you're talking about. The temptation is to be like other people. The temptation is to find the way of least resistance rather than being passionate about it, going forward, and just obeying God. You know, what did he tell Jeremiah? Don't look at their faces. This day I'm going to make you a, a, a brazen wall. I'm going, to make your, I'm going to give you backbone, and you're going to do it. Then the Lord gave me a vision. He says, what your problem is, Dennis, is because you're younger than a lot of the people in the room. He says he, he took a big black screen, like an x-ray, 
and I'll never forget it. It was, a, it was with my eyes wide open, a black screen went over the people and there were big, big heads and little itsy bitsy spirits. And he goes, you just go to the spirit. The education of the mind comes through much, uh, through, uh, through much study. But the education of the heart comes only by the anointing of God. Hmm? It's the question, what, which are you educating here? I called you to educate spiritually. Delay and doubt. And then there's two kinds of vision. There's a retrievable and there's an irretrievable. What would be an irretrievable vision? God gave you something to do. You were, you were going to have 10 kids, but now you're 65 and you have no children. You know what I'd say? That's not retrievable. But if you let it die, you let that vision die, God in his ultimate wisdom will raise up an application that you never thought of. That's the problem is you're interpreting too much. Let God interpret the dream. Might pull a Sarah on you, but if not, if not, you know what that could mean? It could mean that they're spiritual children. But let him interpret, not man, not you, not anybody else. But I'll tell you what, he is smart enough to take your compost pile and make it into a beautiful garden. So the reasoning mind has to be humbled and the heart has to be enlarged to where you just say, God, here I am. And if it's something that's irretrievable, let it crash and burn. Face the pain. But I'll tell you what, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench, but he will bring forth justice for truth. <laughs> He's, gonna, he's not going to he's not going to stay and crush you and punish you for what you didn't do. A lot of people are in big guilt trips and they just gave up because I was supposed to go on a mission field when I'm young and I never did and so therefore da 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 da. You know, there's so many different ways now to minister. I had a guy who basically beat himself cuz he didn't go on a mission field. He got a job as a driver uh, driving instructor and all of the people that came from other countries had to get a driver's license they came to him and he was so fulfilled he just loved witnessing to people from other countries coming to get their driver's license he said I didn't have to go to those other countries they came but you know you wouldn't interpret that on your own you wouldn't come up with that this that's where a more implicit trust in God is the way to go and so so let your vision die let it go, I mean, your interpretation, and let God raise it up again. That's what I want to pray this morning. Because uh, I've watched too many people that are in, like, depression, which is really just internal anger. You need to deal with your anger. What do you want that you're not getting? Hey, write these two questions down because this will help you uh, eliminate anything that you're struggling with. Anything that you're struggling with. If you can answer these two questions. What is it you want that you're not getting? What is it you want that you're not getting? What is happening that you don't want to happen? This is good for everybody. I don't care how mature you are. You write that down. You sincerely take that before God. And I'll tell you what. You're positioning yourself for Him to do a miracle in your life because you're no longer in control. Anger is tied to control. Depression is tied to control. Start forgiving yourself. You put demands and expectations on yourself that God never did. You need to take a lesson from David Wilkerson who said, God rebuked him once and said, David, straight is the gate and narrow is the way, but you're making it straighter and narrower than I ever did. <laughs> do you know you can do that to yourself, can't you? Huh? Somehow we have this loving standard for other people. When it comes to us, we think we have a right to beat ourselves up. Let go. Control. Treat it as sin. There really is a life beyond depression. Don't believe your own diagnosis. <laughs> you 
talk to yourself and say, well, that's not true. Because God is true and every man's a liar. And I'm a man and I'm saying, I'm a lion. My own diagnosis is faulty. I'm going to get a second opinion, only it's going to be God. And it really should have been your first opinion. Secondly, choose what you believe over natural feelings. And realize you're probably not objective as to what you need and what you don't need. You're probably, what is it that you need, what is it you don't need? Why not just go to God as your source and let Him give you what you need? You're going to have to learn to trust somebody. But something good's coming in the future. God looks at how how we wait. And waiting is a test. Hmm? Remember that first time that we didn't have a speaking engagement. That was the way we made our living for five months. And Jennifer said, Dennis, I'm just amazed at how well you're doing under the pressure. And shortly after that, I felt like I had a meltdown. <laughs> so she shouldn't have said that, but I was doing good for five months. It's amazing what you can do with willpower. But ultimately, God wants a more implicit trust. And then everything broke from that time on. But I had learned that you can't make something happen. And I really feel for, especially young people who want to be successful, you've got a call of God on your life, you've got a dream, but you're not going to make it happen. Do what's necessary to educate yourself, but watch your heart. Because if the attitude is right, you will succeed. You guarantee there's no failure with a proper heart attitude. It's the stinky attitude that'll get you down every time. And it'll turn to depression. You'll be angry. You'll be in control. But God's got enough wisdom to resurrect your dream in a way that you haven't thought of yet. So, God is able. Perfect love casts out fear. Learn to be a part of a community of faith. Uh, get your focus off yourself. And then answer the question, do you want to get well? There are, there's a small percentage that like the attention you get from being sick. I don't think that's a big percentage. And if that's you, stop it. <laughs> right? But when a vision is fulfilled, lives are changed. I mean... You forget all of the pain, you forget the waiting, you forget all the consequences, all the collateral damage on the way. It just, you're full of purpose. Remember, what did we start out the message with? Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. You're going to fill it with something. But lives are changed. Faith is elevated. And there's two kinds of vision. There's short term and the long term. You want to see what the long term vision for absolutely every believer is? Is that you would bring many sons unto glory. That's the eternal purpose of God. If your vision blocks that as a prime directive, there's probably still too much of you and your dream. Because destiny includes people. Success can be selfish and all by yourself. But destiny is real success. Destiny always includes other people. Pay attention to the divine appointments that God's putting in your life. Pay attention to who's on that stinky old job that you don't like. Pay attention to who's there because those are divine appointments. God placed those people strategically in your life. Divine appointments become divine connections. Divine connections sets up a divine order. That divine order then has a divine purpose. Find out where your tribe is. Find out the camp. Find out who's got that DNA, become part of something bigger than yourself, and very often your vision 
is amplified and secured and upheld in it. By the way, that job at the trucking firm, when God says your time is done here, when I left, another guy came in and was smoking pot with the truckers. And, he, and they said, are you a Christian? Because I, I just left. And they, they had quite a bit of me <laughs> to, to deal with. And he goes, yeah, I'm a Christian. They went and they hung him on a hook that takes out uh, truck engines. They hung him up on a hook in the, uh, in the uh, garage. And they said, you're no Christian. We had one here. We had a real one here. You're not it. Hmm? So your witness is important wherever you're at. They're watching you. As a matter of fact, they know what you, you should do better than you do. Huh? They know, it's funny, uh, they've never read the Bible, but they know how you ought to act. <laughs> Keep you on your toes. Let's pray right now. How many have had the, 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 your dreams, what you feel, crashed? Because God's going to resurrect it if you get your heart right, right today. Get your heart right and start over. He is that wise that He can fix. But most of you, I'd say the vast majority, there's at least half in this room, half watching by you, stream, at least half of you have already seen a transition. And you've already entered in that church. Honor God with it. Don't get cocky and think you did it. Huh? So, Father, right now, for those whose dreams have crashed, we've just released grace and mercy right now that God is going to take out of, that, out of the ashes, God's going to raise up. He's going to give you beauty for ashes. He's going to give you the oil of joy for that spirit of heaviness and depression. I want to pray that you receive forgiveness for being depressed. Receive forgiveness because it's control and it's anger toward inward. I receive forgiveness for giving into that. And right now, I ask for that cleansing by the power of the Holy Spirit to set me free from that control and that anger. I am releasing now into your hands uh, whatever it is that I think I'm not getting and wh whatever is happening that I don't want it to happen, I let it go and I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you once and for all. I'm releasing it and I'm not going to take it back in Jesus' name. And God says, watch the resurrection life rise up when you bring it fully to death. And be not dismayed in the delay. If it doesn't happen instantly, you're being tested as to the heart attitude. Don't let doubt creep in. Don't let other voices sway you. You know, recently we've seen uh, some people who have lost a spouse. And I get very concerned because when that happens, voices come in to tell you what you ought to do. I say, I recommend for anyone that loses a spouse, stay accountable to somebody stable for a good year. Do not make major decisions without some accountability because you're, you're, you're in an emotional state. My mother died and within seven days a woman was going to live in the house with my father to comfort him. She definitely was not of God. Do you have relationships like that? Do you have people that you can confide in, that are stable, that you can bounce things off of? You don't always have to take their advice, but you, sh you should never be afraid to bounce it off of somebody. That's a weakness that I see. When people tell me what they already decided, that's not bouncing it off me. You, you, you're calling me for after the fact. That's more for their conscience and insecurity. So, Father, this is a time and a season where dreams are going to be birthed again. You know, there's the three stages. There's a conception, there's gestation, and then there's birthing. And in some cases, they're being birthed right now, and you're in a new chapter. And others, they're about to, you're about to allow them to die properly so that God can raise it up. And he's not gonna, He knows the plans that He has for you, plans for welfare, not calamity, to give you an expected hope and a quality future. And so, Father, we just seal this work right now, that this is going to be a season where the vision of God is going to be made real to the people of God, and hopelessness is going to be a thing of the past, because in Him there's no such thing as hopelessness. That's the enemy's tactic. 
Christ in you is the hope of glory. Amen. 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 Be full of vision, passion. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.